In this episode, I had a conversation with photographer, engineer, investor, and now Airbnb builder, Devin Lorup, about how the heck he manages to do it all. I've had the pleasure of knowing Devin for quite a while now, and I've always been super amazed by his overall work ethic and his outlook on life. In the past year, he took on a massive challenge to build a storage container home in the depths of Washington known as the Pacific Bin. And after an entire year of building and amassing an entire following on Instagram of over 700,000 followers, the chapter is finally coming to a close. So with that being said, this is Behind the Frames, episode number five. Let the show begin. All right, Devin, what's up, man? How's it going? Good. How you doing, man? Good to be on here. Why don't you give a little brief introduction to like, you know, who you are, maybe give a little bit of a brief timeline of like your time in Michigan and the photography and kind of just the history of everything real quick. Yeah. So my name is Devin Lorup. Uh, just a quick rundown on myself. I uh, grew up in the Chicagoland area, went to school in Michigan, went to engineering school in Michigan. Um, and towards the end of school, my senior year, I started getting into film and photography, had a photo uh, blow up online of the Mackinac Bridge and um, like it was in the middle of the winter. I was able to sell a ton of prints. I like skipped a couple of days of school <laughs> from selling those prints. Ended up buying my dream camera, uh, which Peter McKinnon sort of inspired me to, I mean, the 1DX Mark II. That's sort of, uh, so that photo bought the camera and that just kicked off this whole wild journey of moving out to the West Coast, living in Seattle for the last three and a half years now, um, just diving all into the um, film photography, just media world out here while still working an engineering job, which ultimately got me into short-term rentals and building shit container homes. So uh, yeah, that's a really, really quick synopsis on uh, myself. Yeah, I think I, uh, we had connected, I think it was literally that Mackinac bridge photo, I think. Uh, cause that, that blew up and, and was, that was like back in the day when, uh, I say back in the day, that sounds so crazy. Um, back when everything was about like getting featured on pages on Instagram. And I remember I just seeing that photo everywhere, literally on every feature page. <laughs> I mean, that Michigan community of photographers, I, I felt like it, it really wasn't that big of a community. Everyone sort of knew each other. I mean, there's like 30 or 40, like solid names just bouncing around Michigan. And it was just kind of cool just being able to network and, um, I don't know, just share each other's work and just connect over, over film and photography, man. Yeah. How, how long were you in Michigan for? So I, I went to school there for five years. Um, but I have family all throughout Michigan, so I'm quite familiar with it. Was always up there. Grandparents had a lake house, um, on one of the little inland, inland lakes up there. So, yeah, loved my time in Michigan, um, but yeah, that's that's how long I was out there. Nice. Um, so just kind of touching on photography and film, uh, how did that whole thing start for you? <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. So I I dated a girl in the like probably my sophomore junior year of college, and um, she got into photography. And or she was always sort of into it, and I would just sort of tag along as we were, as we were dating, and sometimes take some Instagram photos for them or whatever. And <laughs> there was one one day closer towards the end of our relationship where she just told me my photos were kind of garbage and um, <laughs> it just sort of roasted me a little bit. I was a little off put, uh, but I sort of took that as a little fire under my belly. I got a drone a couple months later. Uh, I think that was around like my birthday time. I had saved up, got a drone, um, and just started taking photos all over the place. Started messing around with taking or just making like edits from down, like flying in downtown Chicago. I ended up like getting a few random gigs for like news stations down there, just shooting aerials. Um, and I guess just really <laughs> taking that negative um, of her just sort of shooting me down and just going all in and just learning the art, like 
digging. I mean, this is when Peter McKinnon was just blowing up on YouTube. So I would watch every one of his tutorials. As soon as he posts a tutorial, I'm out the next day shooting and trying it out and just messing around with that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of how it, it started. And like you like you said, we connected around the time of that Mackinac Bridge photo, and that's when. Um, I was able to get my first DSLR, which I never thought my first DSLR would be the pinnacle of what I've always wanted. Um, no, that whole Mackinac Bridge photo, um, I guess I can kind of tell the story behind that. So it was like middle middle of winter in Michigan. Winters are just brutal and most people just stay inside for them. So a couple of friends and I were just getting really just sick and tired and we're like, screw it. Let's just bomb up north, see what we can get, maybe spend a weekend up there. Um, so we get up there, the Mackinac Bridge is shut down and we are the Airbnb we had was um, on the other side of the Mackinac Bridge. And I guess it was shut down because giant icicles had formed at the, like on the arches and they were falling down onto the roadway and it was like at risk of damaging cars and stuff. So we were stuck on one side of the bridge. I had one drone battery left because we were flying in a couple spots on our way up there. I'm like, gosh, shoot, let's just throw it up around sunset. And we had this just like ever so slight sunset at the horizon really heavy clouds over top and i flew the drone over the bridge um sort of looking down on the arches and there was not a single car on the road so it just made for just really like almost eerie shot having that just fine line of a sunset in the background and after uh, just messing around with a pretty heavy edit, which I was, that's one edit I'm like super proud of still to this day, even um, it just kind of blew up. I think it got shared on some Facebook page and I had like hundreds of emails pouring in. Like I want to like from just old people all around the state, like I want to hang this above my fireplace. So I literally skipped two <laughs> days of college. I was sitting in, in one of the study rooms, just answering emails, like, flipping prints as fast as i could what i thought was crazy with that photo is after you took that photo i think that just the floodgates opened for anybody owning a drone <laughs> trying to get that same exact shot <laughs> i think up until that photo no one had really seen that like perspective of the mackinac bridge um which i think what was what stopped me in my tracks and probably what stopped a lot of people in their tracks you know so Let's talk about Washington a little bit. So you're, if I'm not mistaken, you're you're an engineer, right? Uh, so I got my degree in mechanical engineering, and I'm working as a project engineer for a general contractor out here. Um, so I've been working that job for the last three and a half years, ever since I moved out here. Um, I guess what drove me out here is I've just always wanted to live by mountains growing up we would take vacations out west and i'd be like oh my goodness it would be so sweet to live somewhere like this and turns out you, you can <laughs> so after school just ended up uh, a, a few buddies and i or one of my other buddies is just like we talked about moving out here and then one week he texted me he's like hey pack my bags i'm going he's like i'll see you in a couple weeks out here <laughs> so we just both full sent it out here I took a little road trip up through Banff. My mom came along and ended up in Seattle, Washington. So, dude, I love it out here. It It's awesome. So my roommate from college, he works at Amazon and is based out of Seattle. And um, we did a cross-country road trip. I think it was, it, it was like right after COVID kind of started dying off. You know, Michigan opened back up so you, so people could people could leave again. And me and my roommates from college were like, yeah, let's just do a road trip. So we like did a cross country road trip through Montana, spent some time in Montana and uh, met up with my friend in Seattle. And Washington might be one of the most gorgeous places I've ever seen, honestly. It it really is. That's something that drew me to it. I mean, like where where I'm living now in Redmond, Washington. So it's just east of Seattle, probably a half hour outside of the city. You can be you're an hour and a half drive from like insane Cascade Mountains, like insane sheer rock cliffs, just like unreal mountain goats, all that sort of stuff. You drive an hour and a half the other way. You're sitting on the ocean watching the sunset with all those crazy sea stacks and you drive an hour and a half the other direction and you're in a desert and it's like you get it's, it's got it all <laughs> so 
Yeah, it it's it's gorgeous. I think what's actually funny is you were the reason why uh, me and my friends went to High Rock Trail. Oh, that, that's uh, right. Lookout. Yeah, you gave you gave me that uh, that tip, and man, what what a tip that was. That would that like blew my mind. Like that view, honestly, like as dramatic as, as it sounds, it it changed my life, man. <laughs> like seeing that from that view is it's crazy it's for real. It's a grind of a hike to get up there, but seriously, anyone that comes to visit, that's that's the hike you got to do because you're just grinding for like an hour. Not, and not, it's not even a super long hike, but you come up and you pop over that cliff. Dude, you you lucked out. They just tore it down. I know. That, I did that see that. That one is uh, torn down now. Yeah, I saw like somebody had posted like a TikTok of, it was like an aerial video of just the platform that was just sitting up on top that I had saw and I was like, wow, got lucky. So that's crazy. I was up there the week after they tore it down. It was actually kind of wild the way they took it apart. They, they flew choppers up there and had guys assembling it and they would just like barrel together, just bundles of wood and then just fly it down. It was like a super cool process to watch, but kind of, a, it's kind of a sad thing. That place looked so cool. Yeah. I, I had seen, this was after, that Seattle trip. I don't remember who it was. I think his name is Drew on YouTube. He's he like lives out of his Jeep and travels. I don't I don't remember his last name, but he had he had camped at the trailhead in the middle of winter and went up there sunrise and completely different look when it's covered in snow. And I, this must have been right before they started tearing it down, probably the winter before, but it was it's insane. Dude, that's gonna be freaky. That place just turns into like a sheet of ice. I can yeah. only imagine. <laughs> oh gosh. But I mean it's like a sheer, you're just almost vertical <laughs> climbing up that thing. Obviously, the biggest thing that you've been working on this entire year is the Pacific Bend. And it's probably why a lot of why most people are listening to this episode. One thing that uh one first off, why don't you just kind of give you know, what was the inspiration behind jumping into this? Yeah. So, <laughs> so when I first moved to Washington, I, I always knew, like I was always big into investing and like the stock market and just understanding how that works. And just like, I, I've always wanted to set myself up financially. And I mean, I've sort of gone into I mean, just this last like four or five years with the mentality of the most valuable currency out there is time and money can buy you time back. If you grind when you're young, you are buying so much time back on the front end. It is it is a sacrifice on the front end, but you are like I've seen it with so many people and I just knew I needed to buckle down for these first couple of years. So I knew real estate was definitely in my cards just from all the investment podcasts and YouTube videos and just people I subscribe to. So I knew real estate definitely had to be in the cards. But out here in Seattle, it's it's like stupid expensive. You you can buy like a 800 square foot home downtown Seattle for like $1.2 million. And I'm like, can't afford that. So um and plus it's just like you're, you're buying an 800 square foot home that has a tiny little lot and there's like druggies down the street and it's like who wants that for a million plus dollars so um just like over over those couple of years working as a filmmaker just being able to get out into washington enjoy the area work with cool brands shoot weddings to like help start saving up for whatever that real estate investment looks like is um uh, I just just spent those couple of years just praying. I'm, I'm Christian, religious, and um, just I really felt like the Lord put something on my heart that is unique and not not of just a conventional real estate investment. So um, I was actually going through Instagram one day and uh, I saw this one one container home. It's called the Box Hop. It's made out of three shipping containers, two on the bottom, and then the other one stacked perpendicular on top. Um, and this just awesome couple, Seth and Emily, out of Ohio, um, they built the home theirs, themselves. It was their like first go at shipping containers home, and it really that's when I just like saw that and I knew something like that would crush out here in Washington. 
Um, so that was sort of the spark that really lit this thing off. So uh, about 15, 16 months ago, um, I had spent, uh, actually it was like two years ago now, um, I was back home for Christmas in, Ch in Chicago with my family and my mom's a designer. And uh, we just started brainstorming. We had like, well, I think it was like Jenga cubes, like sitting on the counter after like Christmas dinner or something like that. And we just started messing around, watching some YouTube videos of Seth and Emily. And we're like, all right, like, I, I think I actually want to do this. So come springtime, uh, I had a chunk of cash saved up. Um, I was just starting to look at properties. I knew I wanted something close to the mountains because it would be a short-term rental. Um, and uh, just after looking at it, it was probably like 50, 60 lots. I ended up even putting a couple offers in on other ones that fell through and looking back at it now, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad those, those fell through. Um, I ended up on this lot just in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. It's a five acre lot. Uh, just heavily forested like when you walk through the lot you would think this lot is just deep 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 in the mountains everything's untouched there's all these huge alder wood stumps that are has that really red bark covered in moss it's just it's something straight out of like a twilight film <laughs> um, so i the the property hit the market within two hours I was able to check it out and within like six hours I had an offer on the property and this is when uh, real estate was sort of going nuts out here and like properties are being snagged like super quick so I, I really didn't think I was going to get this one because after looking at all those other lots I student, sort of knew what a good deal was what a bad deal was and this property was listed way under what it should have been valued at and Within a few hours, I got the notification from my agent. She's like, "Hey, we we got it. We close in. I think we close on like a two two or three days or something." So, closed on the lot, and that was like, <laughs> I I remember heading out there after after we closed, and I just pulled my car to, car on the side of the road. There's literally nothing besides forest. You can't even drive the car on the lot because it's just all just overgrown. There's a huge berm in the front. I just go walk the site and I had a little, uh, like a little stool I sat on the property and I sat on it, took a photo and I'm like, just looking around, it's like, what the heck am I about to do here? It's like, it's real now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just starts setting in and you're like, holy crap, you have no clue what you're doing. So that sort of kicked off just <laughs> the whole, I, 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 I had nothing, I knew nothing about new construction. I mean, being in the construction world, I generally, and being like pretty hands-on growing up, I knew how to put things together, but just going through the permitting process, like sourcing materials, finding reliable contractors, it was just a bear of a task. And just after grinding through for the last the last year pretty much um, i got my permit nine months ago but for the last year we've been clearing the lot building the home um yeah we're pretty much done i'm waiting on two more pieces of furniture and it's just i'm i'm i walk into that house sometimes and i'm like holy smokes one year ago this was a forest there was no power there was no water there was no sewer there was like this is this is a home it's beautiful and like i'm so stinking proud of what I've been able to do, all my friends that have come alongside me, and yeah, I'm just, I feel really blessed to have the community that's around me and even like growing this presence on social media, which is, I never, like my, my goal going into this year was like, I'm going to film the whole thing and I couldn't keep up with it on YouTube because it's just like clocking hundred hour work weeks between my day job and uh, building this thing, but I got to say it was really cool to, because I mean, as a photographer and videographer myself, I know how much work goes into attempting to build a, a following on social media. And, you know, we're dealing with things like algorithms and, and all that. And it, it, it doesn't always work for people, you know, and I, I got to say it was, it was really cool to see you make that amount of impact on, on Instagram. Honestly, it was, it was, it was pretty cool to watch. Yeah, man. I, 
I like I said, I never, never expected that to happen. I, I knew it was a unique idea. Um, but just I like I think I, the stars almost aligned in a way, like with Instagram launching reels. I, I, like it, it like Instagram was pushing reels super hard, right? They they announced like the, the payment program and everything like that. So um I think just leaning into what these large platforms push is a great way to grow. And that's sort of just how the bin took off. Like, I think if I were just documenting this, like the old Instagram from four or five years ago, I don't think it, it would have even got close to three quarters of a million people. Like it was really cool to see, especially it is, it's not even just a following. It is a massive following. Like that's, Honestly, I would say even for some photographers and videographers, a, a, a pretty difficult uh, following to get to. Like almost a million followers is is a huge, huge feat in itself. And one one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, like, what was that? What was that feeling like after many many years of of catering your own Instagram, trying to build a following there to to all of a sudden build this massive this massive fan base on Instagram. What was that like for you? Well, so it, yeah, it, it's sort of an interesting dynamic because like as a filmmaker and photographer, obviously y you want to keep growing on your platform. And that was always a goal of mine, but I would never let mm -hmm. that goal of growing drive my content in a way. Like I always, the content I created was always because I loved doing it. Like, if I'm going on like a waterfall spree, like I'm posting it because I love it. And um, so it, it was, it was just interesting going from that sort of mindset to I'm going to grow a business and utilize a platform and not like extort the platform, but I'm just going to use the tools that they are saying these tools work like Instagram reels will grow your platform, which me as a photographer, if I were still doing the photography as hard as I was a couple of years ago. And like, I honestly don't think I would have got into reels as heavy just because I genuinely love taking photos and I love spending hours editing photos. I don't necessarily want to show the whole editing process. Like some people who are doing photography, but sharing reels do. I'm just like, I just did that because I love it. But switching to that mindset of I'm going to grow a business here and really grow just like a community of people who are passionate about learning about building that also want to just stay in really cool, unique homes. Um, yeah, just kind of, kind of cool being able to utilize the tools that these platforms give you. And, um, but yeah, never, never expected it to get to this size. There's, <laughs> I, I launched a website uh, about six, eight months ago where I opened like an early reservation list for staying at the bin. And there's 5,000 plus people on that, which on like an average people stay at Airbnb is two and a half nights, which is a 30 year backlog. If everyone on that books, that's so wild that first of all, let me just, let me just say this before we continue. Congratulations, man. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's, Thanks. that's huge. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean it, like I said, I, I keep saying this over and over again, but it was really cool to watch start to finish and also see it like on social media, especially see it work and see the overall build come to fruition, you know? Cause I think like that feeling that you had when you first like bought the land and you're like, okay, now it's real. Now, you, now you got to, you know, do this thing and to see how, uh, ambitious and motivated and, uh, you were just hitting the project head on, you know, and, uh, it was, just, it was super cool to watch. <laughs> yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Cause I never, um, I guess the, the goal of this project is not to just selfishly make all this money and just live a life of wealth and everything. Like, I was even just telling my girlfriend this earlier today, like one of the the main goals with this home is to be able to bless other people, whether that's financially, like offering my time with them. Um, and I, I really think that growing this 
platform, people almost saw that authenticity, or at least I hope that's what I tried to portray. Um, the authenticity of I want to help people, like showing the processes of the build is like, it's cool seeing a cool home go up, but I hope people saw throughout the build that I am a genuine person. I want to help people and just, um, I think this home is really going to enable that, whether financially with my time or even just helping other entrepreneurs um, that are diving into this sort of world. Um, yeah. One thing that I thought was really interesting, uh, just seeing what you did on Instagram is I think people would have expected like a photographer and videographer to go above and beyond with the quality on Instagram. But I, I love that you kept it simple and it was more you're, you're documenting, not creating. Yeah, it's like it's that fine line between art and documenting and just, I guess... I had a tough time with that at first because if you look at some of my early on content, I was I was hauling my one DX out there every day. I'm like, I'm going to go do this and then I'm going to go take photos of it along the way. And it's just like, it didn't, I was trying to mix my art and documentation of it with, with too much. And just after leaning into the documentation side of it more and just running around with my phone and like a $13 tripod on Amazon, um, yeah, I think I, I got a lot more joy out of it and it just, it, it felt more authentic. It wasn't like this, like, look at this polished thing that I'm showing you after the fact It's like, no, this is real. This is, this is how it, it actually was. Yeah. That, that's really awesome. One of the questions I had were, was, uh, um, cause you were doing weddings and all that. Were you still doing freelance work on the side while building this thing? Yeah. So I definitely dialed it back quite a bit. So uh, like for real, the timing on this could not have worked out better. I had two and a half, three years to build my media business before diving into the bin. Um, so I was really able to build some awesome repeat clients um, and sort of weed out the, I guess like lower paying, not as um, just like not as like quality clients that you want to work with. Like I, when I film, I try and create as much value for my clients as possible and they appreciate that. And also in return adequately pay me for that value I bring to them. So I was sort of able to build up that base of clients and also sort of made a little bit of a name for myself in the wedding industry. So I was able to take on slightly higher margin weddings um, so some of the more like destination, San Francisco, LA, um, like mountain type weddings, um, where, I mean, that's like stuff I enjoy doing. So it was almost like a break in the action from the bin. So I did 10 or 11 weddings this last year and they were the fun ones I enjoy. I, I'll probably continue to keep doing weddings far into the future. Just, just a handful each year. They're fun. Get to meet so many new people and just from all different walks of life. So that's, just that networking game I love. I'm in this similar situation. So I, I'm a content media manager for a real, real estate brokerage. And um, I, I was doing weddings before that. And I was like, really, you know, jumping into the wedding industry. And then I had the opportunity to get this job. And I took it. And um, I keep telling myself that I'm going to stop doing weddings. And then I get like the, the slight email of like, Hey, like, we got this <laughs> wedding going on. And like, for example, I had, I had a wedding, a last minute person came in and emailed me saying that their wedding videographer dropped out and it was the middle of October peak fall colors. And they gave me all the information of the wedding. And I was like, I can't miss this. Like it's literally like handed to me on a silver platter, the most perfect wedding to go shoot. <laughs> so I'm in the same boat. I probably, I'll, I'll probably always do weddings here and there. Are you still doing freelance work aside from, um, like aside from the real estate marketing job? Uh, honestly, no, I, my biggest thing with taking the real estate job, one was just gaining experience aside from all the other stuff that I've had. And the other thing is I really wanted, like you, um, YouTube's end game for me. Like I, I want to be there so bad. And I knew for me that was going to require me to not have to, to not worry so much about money. 
And that's why I stepped away from freelance was because, you know, I was, there was, there were moments where I was check to check and I wasn't as interested in, uh, scaling that business model i was like more interested in creative work and trying to do things that i actually personally love to do so the real estate brokerage really came at the perfect time for me to to jump into that and that gives me a lot of time to be able to work on this stuff which hence this uh that's where this podcast uh kind of came about too um Super cool. So what, what does YouTube look like for you? Is, is there more aside from the podcast or is the pod you're going all in on the podcast and it's like, you're just going to keep collaborating. My kryptonite is, uh, trying to figure it out before I start. So, um, right now I think I'm just right now I'm going to all in on the podcast and, I think I'm just going to figure it out from there. I really love this idea of the podcast, collaborating, meeting other people, networking. It's something I've never really focused on before. Um, but aside from that, I, I'm not I'm not sure where I'm going to go with it. But I'm kind of just figuring it out as I go. You know, super cool, man. Yeah. So no, my, I think 2023 once once the bins launched and sort of automated a little bit, I think the plan is to really start documenting this whole Airbnb process, like the back end of it, actually being transparent, showing numbers and just documenting all that on YouTube. I mean, people love transparency. And I mean, that's one really cool thing about the podcast too, is like you are getting people telling their stories, being real. And um, I mean, people are attracted to authenticity and um, just learning about the creatives they, they follow and just want to know them on a, on a deeper level. I think uh, one of the things also for me that inspired the podcast is I, I was like hitting like t hitting burnout so much towards the end of that freelance era. era. Um, and I think the podcast for me was me wanting because I was a notorious non collaborator for a long time uh, when I was, uh, you know, doing photography and like when I was in the thick of that whole entire thing. Um, and I was like, you know, I just want to try something different. I want to actually meet people that are like-minded and network. And maybe, maybe that's the missing piece. You know, maybe, maybe the reason why I'm going through that burnout is I'm relying completely on myself to, to inspire myself. And I think maybe I need to step into listening to other people's stories and, um, getting value from other people rather than just. I mean, basically, you don't have to do it alone kind of thing. And I think the podcast is kind of the conduit for that, for me to learn from other people's experiences. And through this podcast, like, I mean, I filmed four podcasts already, and I've already gotten video ideas from from all of them, you know, and then on top of that, I've also, you know, learned from them. So I think that's that's a big piece to this whole thing yeah so. dude no that's cool so like loosely holding those seasons of learning and being able to like mold that into what i mean you don't even know what that looks like now but just like leaning into that season of learning and figuring it out is is super cool and kind of where i'm at too i'm just gonna sort of see what happens um that, that's awesome dude yeah i think I, I think biggest thing for me is uh i just love making stuff and what that's going to be i have no idea but you know figuring it out so dude so yeah. who, who's the who's the dream uh person to have on your podcast like what's the what's the holy grail or someone you would love love to pick their brain oh man um hmm i think maybe someone like uh chris burkhardt or something like that you know um yeah. Or like, I don't know, like I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of like action sports and stuff. So I don't know, maybe like a documentary filmmaker like Jimmy Chin or I don't know, something like that. I, I love, I love that era, which is, which honestly could be a, a way that I go when it comes to YouTube is documentaries. Um, but yeah, I, I would say one of those so dude also don't yeah. stop your your cinematic takes on if, if there's any way to incorporate your cinematic filming with the podcast or i don't i don't know how it would work if you can do like short short stories dude some of your work has got me so freaking hyped like 
be sick to shoot a podcast with them and then be like, yo, I'm coming out for a weekend and we're going to go film like a life as whoever, you know, like your work is incredible, man. Like keep going. I appreciate that. That That's literally uh, what I've thought of. And I kind of started incorporating some of my past footage and B-roll over everything, but I definitely want to do more in that realm. Um, Cause I, I realize, especially like when I'm doing these solo podcasts, I'm most authentic when I'm just going off the cuff. When I try to script my stuff, I, it's a disaster, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, I'm, I'm trying to keep that, that uh, just kind of, I don't know, just talking, speaking what's on my mind and, and all that. So um, I, I want to get back to, to the bin a little bit. Um, one of the questions I actually really had was, what was the, what do you think was the toughest part about building the bin? Oh, wow. <laughs> there were so many hurdles with this thing. Oh, dude. <laughs> were it there was... multiple? <laughs> All right. I mean, I would, the, at least the first six months of the build, I was super stoked to just keep working on this thing. Like I, I got myself in really, 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 really good physical shape leading up to it. So I was ready to just tackle this. I knew how much steel work it was going to be, how much welding it was going to be like the, just the sheer amount of like physical labor was insane. Um, but I think clocking hundred hour work weeks, like literally I'd get into my job at five o'clock in the morning and I'm working until 10, 11 o'clock at night, driving an hour back to Redmond, sleeping for like three or four hours and doing that five days a week and then working Saturday, taking Sunday off and doing it again. I would, I've, I've never worked that hard in my entire life and I would hit burnout so freaking fast. I would try and take like two days off and then uh, just like I would get back to burnout within like three or four days. Um, and the reason why I was doing so much myself is just because everything out here is so, so expensive and I really didn't want to rack up my line of credit. So it was just a constant season of exhaustion, delays, people just, I mean, it, some contractors I worked with were awesome and other ones just were absolutely dropping the ball and I'll be silent firing a lot of them, uh, or not a lot of them, but um yeah exhaustion was a brutal one and just like i don't know it's it like a constant looming stress and there's always the question in the back of your mind of like is this actually gonna work like is there going to be a point where something epically fails like am i gonna miss a structural detail and is this house just gonna come collapsing down which i mean looking back on it now it's like dude, this thing is <laughs> if there's a freaking nuclear war i'm going to the bin this thing is like nuke proof <laughs> but um exhaustion mental exhaustion too just constant like the amount of permitting out here was brutal there's almost like forty thousand dollars to get just to be able to get my paperwork to start moving forward with the construction so um yeah and still trying to like maintain like a happy attitude i mean i there were definitely huge parts of the build i thoroughly enjoyed just love doing them love building i love being hands-on like filming it engaging with the audience like just answering questions but then there's i would especially say even these last like 60 days I've sort of hit the point where I've like, I've showed all the major steps and now I've just been buckling down, like chipping away at this final list of things I need to wrap up. And now it's, like I said, two pieces of furniture show up and some railings go around the deck and the thing is done. So, so question about the build. Um, what was there a learning curve? Like, I'm sure there had to be some things that you didn't already know how to do. Yeah, for sure. So uh, the reason why I went with containers in the first place is, uh, back in high school, I was like a total, just, I was a horrible kid. Like, seriously, this is such a testament to my parents, like drinking, doing <laughs> who, who knows what it was just, it was bad news. Um, yeah. 
So one way my dad sort of cracked the whip on me as a kid is uh, he had a garbage company and he had me work in the summers as a welder. So I'd work 10, 12 hour days working as a welder back in Chicago. And that would sort of get me so tired that on weekends I almost just laid low a little bit, kept myself out of trouble. So in the moment I was pretty frustrated with him, but looking back on it now, it's like, all right, I see you dad. <laughs> um, but so that sort of taught me a lot of, or it taught me all of the welding skills. Um, so that's one reason why I went with containers. Um, but yeah, even like it, there was definitely a huge learning curve on the, Actually, the biggest thing I had to learn was taking a vacant piece of land and getting all the utilities there, like the amount of interfacing with the county, like figuring out where you can drill your wells. Like <laughs> some of that stuff is super cool, too. Oh, at least it's cool to me as an engineer. I'm just like, you can just literally take a stick, jam it way down in the ground and it will forever produce water. It's just super cool. <laughs> but yeah, big, big learning curve for sure. I... It, I learned a lot of lessons for the next one, which there is going to be another one. And I've even been brainstorming some ideas of what it's going to look like and where it's going to be. Um, so I can't say too much yet. And I got to gotta get my girlfriend a, a ring before then. Um, so I can't say too much more <laughs> about it. But uh, there will be a bit bigger and better one. Hey, maybe maybe we'll have to get we'll have to get the collab off and uh I'll come and make a documentary about you making one. <laughs> Dude, let's do it, man. I'd be so freaking down. That'd be sick. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Just a curiosity that I've had from watching you over the years, um, from your job to building the Pacific Bend to uh, investing to photography and film, how do you do so much? <laughs> it blows my mind. I'm kind of OCD and will dive so deep into something like the, the investing deal. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like I get all these little hobbies, dive super deep into them and sort of figure them out. And then I just sort of, once, once I'm like off the huge, like passion drive of learning what this thing's all about, I can sort of just tuck it on the shelf, like still maintain it, keep up with it. Um, but it's not as much as that, like mental just burden on you. So it's like you pick up one tool and you know how that tool works and you just keep using it and then you dive into the next thing and you just keep stacking them on one after another. But this, this next little season here, 2023, especially I'm, I'm taking a big step back. I'm not going all out back into film and photo, trying to pay the house down. I'm like. I'm going to launch the bin. Hopefully the launch goes well and I can sort of just relax a little bit. Like the, I need a, I need a big season of rest. There's been a lot going on and I'm, I'm honestly really, really excited to plug back into community. And even like you were saying, like community really inspires you. And a, a lot of, I, I can feel it in myself. Like a lot of that flame is kind of, it's burning low right now. I, I don't know what the next steps are or what, what the next year looks like. So just pouring into community, giving back, resting, that's that's what this next little season is. And I know it's gonna ramp up into something bigger and better. So um, yeah, and we'll see which one of those little tools decides to come off the shelf and we just dive back into it. <laughs> I Yeah, dude, I mean, I gotta say, it's it's been awesome to watch everything. Your ability to excel in the future is, unlimited. And I think one of those things that I think you're really good at is I think you're extremely smart financially. Creators, artists aren't necessarily known to be in that way. You know, I think uh, a lot of artists might get themselves into situations, too much debt to be able to produce their art. But you, you have all these all these things, investing in stocks, uh, building the Pacific bin, doing your, uh, you have your business and then you have working and it just seems like you've been extremely smart with what you've done with your money. What advice would you have for the creator who wants to excel financially? And obviously this isn't professional advice because we're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for, for sure. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I've lost my shirt on Tesla the last eight months, but <laughs> 
I would say first off, learn learn how to invest your money because having your money work like that's not just the stock market. That's I mean in any sort of way, whether that's investing in in gear that you know will produce more money, or if that is stocks. Like personally, I think investing in areas where your money can work for you while you're sleeping is one of the most important ways. And that's, that's ultimately how the bin was able to be built. Like I, every penny I made from film and photo, I dumped into Tesla. I mean, I kind of lucked out when they blew up, like, and it it wasn't just like, I I was 100% in Tesla. I owned no other stocks. I think at the end of 2020, I sold every other company I owned when I was trying to diversify. And I just poured that all in, into Tesla after I really dove deep into that company, learned about AI. Like AI is going to be a humongous thing in the future here. I mean, we're just seeing the little, little like hints of it starting to enter society. But you know, 10 years from now, like full self driving cars is for sure feel like, like figure it out. And yeah, I think just for creators getting going here, learn how to make your money work for you. Don't buy unnecessary purchases, which ultimately, if you're not buying unnecessary purchases, you can put more money into those investments that are working for you. And it all boils down to time is the most valuable currency. And if you're able to buy more time by working, investing, saving, and like producing work that gains you money that you can keep growing that snowball with, you're you're gonna do well and that way 10 years from now when you're like ah i'm kind of burnt out with all that i've been doing this this last three or four or five years whatever you have that option to sort of reset just network in the community figure out what the next steps are going to be without having to stress about money and then go all in with that next next passion project or whatever it is so investing your money just it's so so worth it even if it's only like 20 30 bucks a week that you're setting aside or just like cutting out like a netflix subscription or a hulu subscription like every penny counts when you're getting going and what inspires you devin (laughs) financial freedom if if i if i had to look at it right now i want to be financially free by the time i'm 30 i'm 28 right now and I, I can see I can see a path there, honestly, within the next year even. I mean, you always got to be wise with your money, but financial freedom is a huge inspiration to me. And um, I mean, that ultimately will feed all of my other passions. Once that one is, for the most part, figured out, I can really pour back into like giving back to others. And just like, I mean, that stuff is, is so fulfilling, like, and that, that really inspires me to push harder. Like if, um, like for example, like Mr. Beast, he, that dude is a massive, massive inspiration. My girlfriend makes fun of me at how much I watch his videos, talk about him. Like I I love trying to understand his brain, watching podcasts with him and seeing how the dude just pours into like, he understands youtube probably better than google's freaking creators of (laughs) youtube the guy just understands the platform so stinking well and that sort of inspired me to just really dive into each individual thing that i get interested in don't have a million other hobbies or like a million other side interests dive full into one thing understand it and you will be successful in it so yeah just like generosity (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Beast, the dude is a freaking legend. And it's, it's just cool that he built a platform around giving back to people. Like his huge growth phase, like when he was going from 10 to 70 million subscribers was when he was doing these massive giveaways. He was like giving away houses to people and just like, I don't know, ge- generosity is contagious and it's just, I mean, like he even says, it just makes you feel good being able to help other people. I, and I love that too. So I also think 
with people like Mr. Beast, like these are people that I think they loved the process first rather than just wanting to make it to an end goal. And I think too many people operate with this, uh, like they have this line of sight of exactly who they want to be. And I think to really get there, to to actually get there, even though there's always going to be more goals to climb after that, um, I think you really just got to enjoy the journey. And if you and if you're doing something where you don't enjoy the process, maybe you need to switch to something that you do. To wrap it up, uh, what advice if you could pick one thing to help a creator, whether they're new or they've been in the industry for a long time? What would you say they should do in 2023? If they're a, a, a young, like, is this in the like photo film industry? Yeah. I mean, anybody who, let's say anybody who wants to just make content and be successful at doing it. Successful meaning uh, being, I mean, simply just being able to make money at it. Ultimately, you, you, you can't grow a massive following doing a million different things. So find something you're passionate about that won't feel like a chore that you don't get easily burned out on and like burnout's inevitable. You're going to hit it no matter what you're doing. So surrounding yourself with a community that gives you inspiration to try new things within that niche. And just, I mean, just like Mr. Beast or like when I was just pouring into these different avenues, just go all in on what you're doing and almost it sounds bad, but like almost obsess about it. And just like, if it's something you're truly passionate about, you will be thinking about it all the time. Like uh, I know people, <laughs> my close friends and family are like, dude, stop talking about the bin and like your tactics on how you're going to market this thing better, how you're going to like grow from this step to this step to this. Step. It's like, just go all in on it. And it, it'll be easy to go all in on it if it's something you're passionate about. So, yeah, and if if you're going all in, it's something you're passionate about and good at. Like, I guess you do have to be like halfway decent. At it. You you will you w- <laughs> you will gain a following. Yeah, there's. I mean, if you're diving so deep into a certain niche, there are people that are interested in that. And I guess ultimately, you're you're you can start making some money off of it. And any social media platforms lean into the latest thing they're pushing. I used to be when like Instagram would launch a new update, like when they launched reels at first, I was super down on them at first. I'm like, this is kind of destroying this platform that we've always known. But if you want to make money as a creator, take all of these new updates. Like when TikTok hopped on, I was like, ah, it's probably going to burn out. But just like, especially if you're just getting going, hop on all these new platforms early even if it's not necessarily what you thought your niche was going to look like if after, after you mess around make a 10 20 30 posts you start finding out like avenues of these new platforms that you like and you can just start blowing up on them and just finding i mean you might even find passion in something you didn't know you'd ever have a passion in so yeah just be open to be open to change surround yourself with a great community and find something you're passionate about would you say that um, th- through this whole year of uh, building the the Pacific Bin, do you think whenever you do decide to step back into photography or like go more into it, do you think any is there any part of you that might change what you're doing there? Like, is it, are you interested in different things now? You know? Yeah, I think I've throughout the bin build process. I've seen the value of building your own brand, which I guess that would also be one one thing I would mention is super important for young creators is to to make yourself the brand. Like Peter McKinnon, for example, just great photographer, like really loves photo and film, but like he he's the brand you're buying when you watch his videos. You love his personality. Like um you're you're here for him ultimately and how he tells stories and i think there's a lot of power in building a community that's based around you and learning who you are like i mean dude even you hosting this podcast here like 
so many people are going to know you on that next level just because of the questions you're asking you and, and like telling your stories and like just conversing with people on the podcast. Just want to say, I mean, to wrap up the podcast, congratulations, honestly, on, on literally, I mean, it seems like I, so you said the, the Pacific bin isn't done or is it almost done? It's 99.9% done. It needs a set of railings and two pieces of furniture. Yeah, it's so almost it's there. almost done. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's been awesome to to see the process of everything. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to say thank you for thank you for being so willing to jump on the podcast. No, thank you, thank you for having me. And I, I mean, I, I know you said congratulations on the success, but seriously, dude, I would not have been able to do any of this without the community, my family. Like, I mean, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, and this is this is not just all me. So, um, I really just gotta thank my family for this success we've hit so far and whatever's to come in the future. But dude, super stoked for this podcast. I, I knew like coming on, you go all in when you, when you dive into something. So I, I knew this was going to be, be something sweet, dude. Well, let's, uh, let's hop back on for episode 105 and, uh, Hey man, we'll be here. We'll be here for it. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate you being on. Um, and yeah, is there anybody? Is there anywhere you want people to to find you? Do you do you want to send them anywhere? A website, your Instagram, anything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just on Instagram, Devin underscore Laura. Or if you're interested in staying in a wild shipping container home, the Pacific Bin on Instagram, um, and hopefully YouTube. It's going all out this year. Uh, just Devin Laura on YouTube. So. Yeah. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. I'll probably shoot you an email uh, or actually I'll just DM you on Instagram with information and I can send you the raw footage if you want that too. Okay. Perfect, dude. I'll be sharing it on the, on the bins page. People are, uh, yeah, people are going to love this. I appreciate it. Yeah. See you later, dude. And I uh, look forward to seeing what else you do.